Good morning again. I'm uh, Ramesh Shivdasani from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And I'm Carl Gay from MD Anderson Cancer Center. And it's a pleasure to uh, co-moderate the next session this morning after a terrific start to this symposium. The topic of this is, uh, is genetics, and it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Jerome Cross from the University of Paris. And I believe Jerome is going to be uh, speaking virtually. So good morning, my name is uh, Jerome Cross. I'm a professor of pathology in Boson Hospital in uh, Paris, France. And I wanted to thank the uh, Net Research Foundation for its invitation to discuss today the uh, immunophenotypic and molecular characterization of rare planets that produce serotonin. It's my disclosure. So this, this project started from two observations in the tumor board, uh, some that we often have a panet with very odd clinical presentation, one of those being uh, main duct dilatation, which is not a classical hallmark of panet. And when we looked at those with radiologists, you see about 13% of those panets uh, do have a main duct dilatation, and about a third of those are because they are panet very peculiar with high secretion of serotonin. So here you see an MRI with a stop in the, in the main pancreatic duct. That's because of the uh, very highly fibrotic tumor. And this highly fibrotic tumor is a net with a high expression of serotonin. You see it on the IHC on the right. The second odd observation is uh, we, we had a few of those. This patient with a resected panet. You see uh, one in, in 2012. And then two years after, uh, we found uh, another panet that was from the small bowel and it expressed high level of serotonin, it's classical. And so we went back to the primary pancreatic tumors and see that this tumor is also high expressing tumor for serotonin. And this raised the question to whether it's a primary pancreatinate expressing serotonin or whether it's the pancreatic metastasis of the small bowel net that was discovered afterwards. And this would dramatically change the way you handle the patient care. So the aim of this project was to describe the molecular features of this really rare planet. You see less than 5%, their molecular profile, what are the cells of origin, and to understand why they have such a fibrotic stroma. And then we wanted to develop tools that we could use to distinguish those primary peculiar uh, pancreatic nets from small bowel metastasis to the pancreas. So to do this, we queried our database to find those tumors. We found about 30 of those, about 15-year courses. You see, it's pretty rare. And we had control groups for the RNA-seq and the IHC studies that were uh, using small bowel primary tumors and classical non-functional pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, when we look at the classic Call, uh, clinical pathological features of these tumors, you see that they are very small and very low proliferating, but they do have a very important stroma that you see in the bottom that's very unusual for pancreatic net. We then looked at their genomic profile doing a very large panel of 500 genes plus a SNPRA for the copy number, and they had a very peculiar profile with a loss of chromosome 1 that was most of the time isolated, and you see in more than 60% of the cases, we confirmed this by FISH, as a collaboration with the oral parents group. And this very peculiar loss of chromosome 1 is not because the small panet, because a large series of molecular uh, profile for small panet was published by Aldous Scarpa's group and they didn't find. So it's very peculiar to this serotonin producing uh, panet. They had no mutation uh, that was classical to small bowel panet. There was no CDK N1B mutation, no loss of chromosome 18. And the only few alteration we found was the in ARID1A gene that is actually on chromosome 1 and KMT2C, which is chromatin remodeling gene. Uh, we then look at their transcriptomic profile, and you see here on the principal component analysis that those serotonin producing panet in green are very close to classical non functioning panet and very far from small bowel net. So clearly they are of pancreatic origin. When we look then at the pathway that were enriched in those serotonin producing panet comparing to the uh, non functioning panet, you see that they have a very strong enrichment in the beta cell signatures, and you see that they express high level on the right of PDX1 and low level of, of IRX, so they are really beta cell like uh, tumor cells. They also had a very high uh, expression of signatures for activation of um, fibroblast and a remodeling of the extracellular matrix. And you see on the right that they have really high amounts of collagen. 
very unusual for pancreatic nets. And they also had, as expected, a very high enrichment in the tryptophan and serotonin metabolism with high expression of the two enzymes that cue the tryptophan pathway towards the production of um, serotonin, like you would find in small bowel nets, so really an intermediate profile. So to try to understand what was the reason for this very densely fibrotic stroma, we took uh, pancreatic stellate cells that were immortalized and treated them with vehicle or serotonin and did RNA-seq. And we found that the treatment with serotonin was increasing uh, their signatures of proliferation and that was confirmed in vitro. We grow them and you see on the right that the serotonin increased their proliferation. And they also activate those stellate cells because you see that signatures of activation are decreased when treated with, with serotonin. Uh, we also found similar, like in tumor, we found that the uh, TGF-beta and matrix remodeling were highly activated by serotonin treatment in those uh, fibroblasts, uh, confirming what we saw in, in tumor cells. Um, to try to uh, answer our second aim, that was to develop tools to better distinguish those tumors from metastasis from small bowel, what you can see is that if you use PDX1 and PAXIS that are highly expressed in those uh, serotonin producing panet, but very low, or almost no expressed in small bowel panet, you can make the difference uh, in clinical practice. So to summarize, we think that the uh, first event happens in a, in a beta cell with the loss of the chromosome one that drives this beta cell into a tumorogenic process. And uh, it's known that some normal beta cells do secrete serotonin to control alpha cells uh, glucagon production and also to dialogue with the autonomous system. So we, we think that this tumor originates from a, a normal beta cells. Then once this tumor is, is big enough, it secretes high level of serotonin that activate the surrounding uh, stellate cells leading to uh, their proliferation, the secretion of high amounts of matrix. And serotonin is a well-known uh, player in different organs to skew the uh, tryptophan pathway towards serotonin and induce a very high production of matrix through uh, TGF-beta uh, signaling. And so that this ends up in uh, this very peculiar panet with a high desmoplastic stroma whose diagnostic is difficult and main duct dilatation and PDX1 and PAX6 are the two best markers to differentiate them from a metastasis of small bowel net. And so I wanted to thank uh, all my group in, uh, in INSERM, Thomas Depoy with Marco uh, Giorgardi Burgio, who did most of uh, this work, and the Beaujon uh, Enet Center of Excellence, and uh, Aurel Perrin and Ilaria Mariononi for the fish uh, analysis uh, for chromosome one. Thank you very much. And the NetRF for their uh, support in uh, this endeavor. Thank you. Very nice presentation. Questions for Jerome? I had a question while you were presenting that I was surprised that you end up following on the idea that this was the beta cell with the absence of PDX and then you kind of presented some overlapping transcription. Um, at least in the in mouse models during pregnancy things, the, the serotonin signal goes up and there's some serotonin specific cells. Have you tried to look to see whether or not that subset of beta cells is actually where this is, these are growing from or try to look at animal models? Uh, we, we didn't have any any uh, mouse model. So in, in in human, the limitation is that you you basically have a, a non-dynamic model. We this the, the paper that you mentioned that the uh, during there is sort of beta cell augmentation during pregnancy, and that those are the ones that are driving uh, serotonin. Plus, um, the, with few papers showing that beta cells really do secrete serotonin within uh, the normal islets. That led us to think that maybe those are the, the, the cells that are the originating um, tumor cells from, from these type of tumors. But it's true that we, we, we don't have proof in, in, in human, and uh, it's been reported uh, in, in many cases that um, panets, they could switch their uh, secreting profile, uh, meaning that you can have a, a, a non-functioning panet that becomes insulin secreting during the progression. So, yeah, of course, we cannot be truly, truly sure that they do originate from, from a beta cell. Um, but because also the, the data shows that the, the beta cells are usually the, at least the, the beta cell phenotypes are the ones that are the less uh, proliferative and the, the early stages. So our, our next speaker will be uh, Netta Makinen from Dana-Farber, and she'll be talking to us about some multifocal ileal 
uh, neuroendocrine tumors, which is a nice segue from, from the prior talk. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Nefta Mackinen, and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow in the laboratory of Dr. Matthew Morrison at Dana Farber Cancer Institute. I would like to thank the NetRF for this opportunity to share some of our recent findings on multifocal ileal nets with you. So I'm presenting today on behalf of a large group of people. These efforts are led by Drs. Matthew Morrison, Eric Nakakura, and Chrissy Thurwell. And I would like to thank all my colleagues from DFCI, UCSF, and the UK, as well as our collaborators for their efforts. And this work has, would not have been possible without the generous funding from NetRF. So our overall goal has been to find the cause or causes of small intestinal nets. And we have focused on the identification of potential genomic and environmental causes of cyanet pathogenesis using various high throughput sequencing methodologies listed here on the slide. So cyanets are the most common neoplasms of small bowel. Majority of these tumors are located in the distal ileum with a high incidence of multiple um, synchronous primary tumors. We wanted to focus specifically on these multifocal lesions in our efforts because they provide us an opportunity to study the disease and its clonal architecture within a patient. Dr. Nakakura accrued a well annotated collection of um, well annotated collection of samples from 14 multifocal ileal net patients, including 90 primary tumors, 20 metastases, and their corresponding normal ileum, as well as whole blood specimens. All these patients had been diagnosed with a sporadic disease, and the number of synchronous primary tumors varied from 2 to 18 among the patients. So previous high throughput sequencing studies, which had focused on sequencing single primary tumors from cyanet patients, had already shown that cyanets have a low somatic mutation rate. The most frequent somatic alteration identified was loss of heterozygosity at chromosome 18 in 70% of tumors. And the only recurrent somatic mutations identified were loss of function mutations in a gene called CDKN1B in approximately 10% of tumors. Also, in 2019, a whole genome sequencing study of over 2,500 metastatic solid tumors showed that cyanets were the only tumor type in which um, candidate driver genes were rarely found. Interestingly, in this study, out of 34 samples with no known cancer drivers, 18 of them were cyanets. So we have to date published two high throughput sequencing papers studying the genomic background of multifocal ileal nets. We have demonstrated that individual tumors from the same patient display distinct mutational patterns, including distinct patterns of chromosome 18 LOH, which suggests that these lesions develop independently. We also observed that multiple metastases from the same patient can originate from one primary or several primary tumors, which has an important clinical implication, highlighting the need to identify and remove all primary tumors. Thus, although previous high throughput sequencing studies and X chromosome inactivation studies have suggested that these multifocal cyanets are clonal in origin, our recent studies have shown um, with clear genetic evidence that these lesions are polyclonal. In addition to genome data, we have generated RNA sequencing data of multifocal ileal nets from 11 patients. I'm showing here the results of a differential gene expression analysis of 68 primary ileal nets and their matched normal ileum samples. We identified over 16,000 statistically significant differentially expressed genes. Approximately half of these genes were upregulated and half downregulated in the primary tumors. On the right, you can see the top 10 most differentially expressed genes, all of which were actually upregulated in the primary tumors. And interestingly, the top three genes can be functionally related to neuroendocrine cells and the processing or transport of hormones, pe peptides, or monoamines such as serotonin. Because, uh, or based on the enrichment of science in the ileum and the independent clonal origin of these multifocal ileal nets, we hypothesize now that the tumor microenvironment um, in the ileum plays a role in the crowd and development of cyanets. 
So we have used the RNA sequencing data to identify differentially expressed secreted hormones, peptides, growth factors, and their corresponding re receptors in the tumor samples compared to the normal samples. And to date, we have identified a set of receptors, three of which I'm showing here, that are overexpressed in the tumor samples, suggesting that maybe they are needed for the promotion of tumor growth. And I would also like to mention here that uh, we have used the RNA sequencing data to identify potential infectious causes of cyanide pathogenesis. However, there are no enrichment of bacteria in the tumors compared to normals or vice versa, and no known cancer viruses have been detected. Then, in addition to genome and transcriptome sequencing data, we have also generated DNA methylation data of these multifocal ileal nets from 11 patients. So Amy has analyzed the DNA methylation array data for differential methylation, uh, epigenetic aging, and metabolic traits. And I'm showing here today the results of her epigenetic clock analysis, where she assessed the differences in the epigenetic age patterns between multifocal primary tumors and metastases within each patient. So the inferred epigenetic age of the tumor samples was consistently higher than that of the matched normal ileum. And also the inferred age of the metastases was closest to those primary tumors from which they had originated from based on the whole genome sequencing data. We also performed a reduced representation bisulfide sequencing of a smaller set of multifocal ileal nets. Nana and Carla have processed the RBS data using an algorithm called CAMDAC and identified 31 high quality tumor samples and over 3 million CPGs eligible for further analysis. Here you can see an unsupervised hierarchical clustering of the most variable CPGs of the primary ileal nets and normal ileum samples. And as you can see, the normals and tumors clearly separate from each other. And there is a major component of hypermethylated CPGs in the tumor samples suggesting of high transcriptional activation. Interestingly also, the samples from the same patient did not always cluster together meaning that there is a high level of heterogeneity between these tumors. Then to identify apparent methylation events in multifocal ileal nets, Nana and Carla queried uh, differential methylation between the CAMDAC purified primary tumors and normal ileum samples. They identified over 500,000 differentially methylated positions, DMPs, of which 75% were hypermethylated. These DMPs were enriched in intragenic and intranic sites. However, hypermethylation was observed across the genomic regions. And then to identify genes with aberrant methylation, Nana and Carla detected differentially methylated regions, DMRs, overlapping promoters. So they identified almost 4,000 promoter DMRs that you can see here on the right in the six plot. So the hypermethylated DMRs are shown in blue and the hypermethylated DMRs in red. And interestingly, they identified a few DMRs in chromosome 18 where the LOH is frequent. So to conclude, um, lack of shared somatic variation in multifocal ileal nets within a patient suggests that these tumors develop independently. We identified several differentially expressed genes in multifocal ileal nets compared to the normal ileum. Uh, infectious agents unlikely play a role in the cyanide pathogenesis. And relative to the normal ileum, methylation in CPG-rich regions of multifocal cyanides um, is disrupted and most frequently through loss of methylation. So here on my last slide, I have our other ongoing efforts and future plans. So basically, one of our hypotheses has been that cyanides arise as a result of field cancerization. Our analyses are still ongoing. However, it doesn't look likely that this is the case. We are analyzing also the whole genome sequencing data for germline variation. We are interested in those germline variants that are enriched in the cyanide patients compared to general population. And then we know that cyanides originate from enterochromaffin cells, which are rare secretory cells comprising 1% of all the epithel epithelial cells. So ideally, for the RNA sequencing and DNA methylation um, 
sequencing data analysis, the interchromaffin cells would be the ideal control compared to the normal bulk ileum sample. Uh, we have received interchromaffin-like cells from our collaborators, the Shift Asani Lab, which we will integrate with our existing data. And we would like to also in the future create single cell RNA sequencing data from those normal ileum samples we have. And we are also continuing the DNA methylation analysis, next identifying differentially methylated enhancers, um, investigating the heterogeneity between tumors within each patient, and also integrating the DNA methylation array, RRBS, and gene expression data. So thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Can you clarify what you mean by field cancer research? Yes. So we have been thinking that if you have a patient with multiple um, primary tumors in the ileum, maybe something happens already in the normal ileum, like mosaicism basically, which leads to then multiple uh, independent tumors. So looking specifically at the normal ileum, and would there be any acquired changes already happening there? So you say no because Yes, so basically we have identified acquired somatic changes in the normal ileum. There are a few structural variants, a few copy number alterations, really, really small, and then a lot of non-coding um, uh, single nucleotide variants. However, none of them are recurrent per se, and also um, not many of those are actually present then in the primary tumors from the same patient. So what we would like to see is that something we would see in low frequency in the normal ileum and then enriched in the primary tumor, suggesting to us that it would play a role for the tumor development. You're looking at normal ileum? Yes. And did you compare the normal ileum from those who have had multiple to the normal ileum from those who haven't had multiple? No, we actually are comparing per patient the normal ileum to the whole blood sample of that patient. So we, keep, we think that the whole blood is the germline of that patient and normal ileum we kind of treat it as a tumor, so comparing the whole blood to the normal ileum. But you can't exclude that there's subcells that are aberrant. I mean, you're looking at the entire ileum, right? So that is true, and that's... Some critical... I mean, it has to be a field defect. <laughs> Well, that would be amazing uh, if that would be the cause. Uh, I think the problem here is also when we look at the normal ileum data, we have to take into account every single variant we see only in one read because that read can represent already the enterochromaffin cells in that sample. And sometimes it's really tricky to say if this is actually when you have like a coverage of 80 reads in a position and then one read has the mutation, is that a technical error or is that actually reality? So I think there has been also like these technicalities to analyze the data. But yes, we can't for sure say that that wouldn't be there. I mean, that's what I tell patients all the time. So that's why you need to do that. <laughs> Hi, Don Klo. Um, I fantastic talk. It's beautiful and it's a lot of work. I was just wondering, are you planning to uh, get proteome or kinome data that you can integrate with all your beautiful genetic data that you're that you're gathering? So the question is that would are we considering also creating proteome or kinome t data from these samples? I think we have a really unique data set or, or like sample set here and cohort. We should definitely look into those as well. We haven't discussed specifically on that, but I don't see a reason why we wouldn't do that. So yes, that could be a nice thing. Uh, have you tried to compare multifocal to unifocal tumors? And the second question related is uh, when you compare tumor to normal, and find differentially expressed genes or differentially mutilated regions. Do you think that could also be due to the fact that the cell of origin is actually very rare in the normal tissue? So you are not really actually looking at the, the effect of the tumor itself, but the cell of origin itself? We do actually have um, also samples from unifocal patients. And I, on genomic level, I have checked the genomic landscape of both of those. Uh, and there seems to be no differences in those, at least on genomic level. And that has been kind of a concern for us sometimes thinking about like what we are actually comparing to each other. That's why we have been trying to concentrate only on those findings that are clearly enriched in the tumor samples compared to the normal or clearly downregulated in the tumor samples compared to the normal because we believe that the tumor samples are enriched really with the enterochromaffin cells. So, so if we see that 
change that would be biologically relevant, but um, yeah. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, so just a point of clarification, when you were showing your receptor data, um, was it GLP receptor or GIP receptor? And, and it's only relevant, obviously, because we're using Ozempic now in some of yes. our patients. So I'm just wondering if we're causing yes. a problem. So, so what you saw on the gene expression um, receptor data, uh, that was GIP receptor. And interestingly, what I forgot to mention is that those results were interesting for us because it was supported by a previous DNA methylation study done on unifocal synets. So that kind of like made it a bigger thing for us. We have uh, one non-AV question. Uh, this is from Chris Harris. It says, after reading all the informatics studies on iNets over the past 10 years, my sense is that these approaches tell us very little about the genes that cause these tumors to develop. I think that the best way to understand iNets is to exploit mouse models for iNets, which have revealed the alterations are the alterations that alter IGF-2, RB1, and P53 pathways in both mice and patients? Yes, um, I think personally still uh, bioinformatics can give us a lot. Uh, of course, they give us lists of candidates which need to be functionally validated later on. And the problem for us has been that there has been no uh, great sided models to study them in, which we are really excited to hear about today that there might be something coming in the near future. Um, but I still feel that um, really digging into the genomic landscape or transcriptome of these samples will give us ideas where to take the, the, the research next. Thank you so much, Netta. And thanks, thanks to the audience for a great discussion there. We'll move on. So the next speaker is uh, Matthew Fall from the IARC on uh, integrative omics analysis of uh, aggressive pulmonary carcinoids. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Mathieu Foll. I'm a researcher at the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And I'm representing today our team, the Rare Cancer Genomics team that I lead together with my colleague, Lynette Fernandez-Cuesta. So today I will talk to you about our work on the molecular multiomics characterization of uh, pulmonary carcinoids, of aggressive pulmonary carcinoids. So just a very quick introduction, because this has been mentioned several times, and I'm sure most of you are, are aware of this. But uh, so in, in, in lung uh, neuroendocrine neoplasms, we don't have a grade three tumor. We have typical carcinoids, atypical carcinoid, and then the high grade uh, carcinomas. But actually in a in 2019, we have performed a, a multi-omics characterization of these lung carcinoids using whole genome, transcriptome, and methylome uh, analysis. And we have found that some lung carcinoids actually have a, a molecular profile of high-grade carcinomas. And uh, I will just show you that better just after. But, but what we did is some, some clustering of, of our tumors, and we found out that actually some uh, carcinoids cluster with, uh, with a high-grade uh, carcinoma and that they also have a very similar uh, clinical outcome with a poor prognosis, uh, but they still morphologically look totally like uh, carcinoids. And um, these are rare subtype of a rare type of tumor. So we had very few sample. And then we have now we are, we are trying to understand this, this uh, molecular link and how these neuroendocrine tumors with molecular and clinical features of neuroendocrine carcinoma uh, exactly look like. So there are a lot of questions around this. So is there a progression from maybe grade one to grade three, typical to atypical, and eventually then to higher grades? Or are they like a totally separate entity, a bit like the grade three in the GI uh, nets? Uh, what exactly is their clinical behavior? Are there some characteristics that could be applied to, to diagnosis, but also to, to, to treatment of these patients? So for this, we have designed the lung genomic studies that has been uh, founded by, uh, by Net Research Foundation uh, with an investigator award uh, to, to Lynette. And we have built a, a very large international cohort of more than 250 cases of lung carcinoids for which we have detailed clinical data, central pathological review. And for depending on the samples, we have whole genome sequencing, transcriptome sequencing, DNA methylation array, and for a few of them, I will show uh, some digital spatial profiling uh, proteomics data. And we also have multi-regional sampling for some tumors. So in the end, this is a very large series. Uh, we have now generated almost 200 uh, transcriptome and methylene, methylome, uh, almost 100 whole genome sequencing. We have tried to enrich for atypical carcinoids. 
uh, we are still also using previously published data because this is a rare tumor and this is again a rare subtype of a rare type. So we are trying also to use previously published data and, uh, and we think this is very important uh, in the field. And for that, we have been integrating our data set with what we published in the previous series that I mentioned, but also the large cell uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma data previously published. Actually, uh, in, uh, in some cases, we have looked also at small cell lung cancer, but also by other groups like the LADA et al. Uh, study and the Miyanaga study, who have also uh, generated transcriptome. And actually, these this other studies uh, we have found after reanalyzing the data that they also contain for some of them this high aggressive supracarcinoid, as we name them, uh, one in, in the LADA study, one in the Miyanaga study. And so this is how we identify them. We start with this very large uh, dimensional transcriptome and metinome data, and we try to do some dimensional reduction. And this is what we call the multi-omics factor analysis. It's kind of generalization of principal component analysis, but for multiple omics data. And then we try to we reduce the dimension of this data into like what you could call a tumor map. That's, that's a two-dimensional map where you can see each dot being a patient. Uh, tumor, and then you have this uh, uh, proximity in the, this molecular space that indicates the uh, proximity of, of the patient in terms of their molecular profile. And then what you can see is that in, in, in green, you have all the carcinoids, dark green being the atypical carcinoids, and in brown, you have the, the large cell uh, carc neuroendocrine carcinoma. And you see that there is this y-axis that is really uh, linked with, uh, with the grades, uh, the, the LCNEC are all at the top, but you can still see some green dots within the, the brown. So these are the, the samples that we call the supracarcinoid because they have a very similar molecular profile to LCNEC, but still they were uh, classified as carcinoids. And so that's the way we have been doing in our previous studies. But now we have actually identified that for some of them that look a bit in between in these graphics, this is because the cluster with LCNEC only when we look at the transcriptome data, but if we look at the metilome data, they just look like any other carcinoid. And we have also the alternative possibility that when we look at the transcriptome data, they look like carcinoid, but when we look at the metilome data, now they cluster with large cell endocrine carcinoma. So it seems that there are different processes that can, that can work. In total, we have identified now 17 such supracarcinoids that can be both typical or atypical, and intermediate profile also do exist. And just to, to also show you, when we do some clustering here, we, we find again the three molecular groups that we have found before in carcinoids. So this is some kind of discrepancy because the, the typical classification is carcinoid being grade one or grade two. But when we do some molecular analysis, we find actually three groups of carcinoids that we named A1, A2, and B. And we find that again in this new series. And we actually found that also in the, in the other series published by others that we have analyzed. And something interesting is that the, the supracarcinoids, they all, when we don't consider LCNEX, they all cluster with carcinoid A1. So they seem to come from a very specific molecular group of carcinoid. But also something to note is that when we don't consider LCNEX, they cluster with A1. We have tried also to look at uh, including small cell lung cancer. So they always preferably cluster with LCNEC. So not with small cell, but we don't, when we don't put LCNEC into the, into the algorithm, they, they go with small cell lung cancer. So they really have some high grade features, uh, even though that's more uh, clearly indicated, pointing toward uh, something similar to LCNEC. In terms of survival, this confirms a bit what we have seen before with just very few samples. Now it's more robust, but these supracarcinoids have a very similar survival to LCNEC. In terms of molecular features, I won't go into the details because there are a lot of genes here, but just to, to, to mention the supracarcinoid uh, termed SC here, what we have found before is that they were similar to LCNEC, but we didn't really know which type of LCNEC because there are two different types. One is, is more expressing neuroendocrine markers like uh, ASCL1 here or DL3, but the other type 2 LCNEC is, is not expressing this marker and has more mutation in T53 or RB1. So we actually find now that this supracarcinoid can be a bit of both types. So some express this neuroendocrine marker, but some don't. Also in terms of, for example, KE67, just uh, here still on the gene expression, we see that they have some kind of intermediate level of K67 on the gene expression. Then we have looked at the immune environment. We have seen before that this, uh, on the few samples we had initially, that they were expressing high immune checkpoint genes. 
And now we have looked at the digital spatial profiling and we have identified areas with high proliferation, high immune infiltration. And we have really found that uh, carcinoid with a high infiltration have a high value of this y-axis I was mentioning, so are closer to, to LCNEC. And they also, in terms of, of which type of immune cells, they have a lot of neutrophils and a lot of macrophages. So now, after seeing this, Again, discrepancy between the molecular classification and the histopathological classification and this aggressive carcinoid. We have, now we are trying to reconcile a bit the different classification and understand why they are different. Are they different or are they just complementary or are one is wrong, one is true? We, we don't really know. So the first thing we have tried to do is K67 because that's one of the, of the criteria between the tumor and the carcinoma. And it's not part of the WHO classification for lung carcinoid to decide between typical and atypical. So we have developed an algorithm to try to make some automatic quantification using some deep learning. Of course, we also have the, the pathologist estimate. And what we have found first is that if you both take into account the, on the wall slide image, the number of positive cells, the proportion of positive cells, but also their, their spatial arrangement. So if they cluster together, this positive cell, uh, we, we, we have found that this is a, a, quite a good way, in fact, to, to, sorry, to discriminate between typical and atypical carcinoid, and this has a very good prognosis value. But also that our supracarcinoid, they have a much higher K67 estimate. And the second thing we have tried is looking back at the HNE slide, because that's how now it is currently, the classification is currently being performed. So is there some specific pattern on the HNE slide that pathologists could recognize to, to actually diagnose this more aggressive carcinoid? And what we have tried to do is to train what we call an anomaly detection algorithm. It's an algorithm where you show normal, so images without anomalies, and then we put typical carcinoid in there, and it learns and tries to find patterns that he has never seen before when you present the algorithm images. So we were hoping to find maybe some, some particular pattern in atypical carcinoid. And actually what we found is that this number of anomalies, this anomaly score as we call it, is actually clustered with uh, this molecular aggressiveness, so this y-axis I showed before, uh, showing carcinoid more close to, to LCNEC. And then the last two things that we have also tried to look at other markers, because pathologists, if you look at the literature, they have proposed several markers also for potentially diagnosis of carcinoid, so OTP, CD44, etc. And so we have found actually that our molecular clusters, here there are the five box plots here, A1, A2, and B, our three molecular clusters of carcinoid, plus LCNEC for reference and our supracarcinoid. Actually, these markers that have been proposed before, they, they match very well with our molecular classification. And we have collaboration now with Maastricht University where they are trying to do some chemistry of some of these markers and actually find that they match perfectly with, with our classification uh, based only on, on molecular data. Very similar approach uh, after, after the NETS meeting actually last year, a, a radiologist coming to us, David Tayeb, who, who, who were trying to understand if the molecular classification we do is actually reflecting what they see on PET images. And, and as you know, there are some carcinoids that don't express somatostatin receptors that are negative, like here, but they can be positive for other tracers like uh, DOPA. And here, that's exactly what we found. I will not go into all the detail, but again, that's a box plot of gene expression we find in our transcriptomic data. And we actually do find, for example, that the A1, which is also supra supracarcinoid, don't really express somatostatin receptor, but do express other genes like LAT families that could be useful in the clinics. So overall, just to summarize, supracarcinoids, what we call are aggressive lung carcinoids. They have carcinoid morphology, but LCNEC molecular profiles. It can be transcriptome, methylome, or both. They have a high immune checkpoint gene expression. They have low OTP, but intermediate K67. They have a high infiltration with neutrophils and macrophages in particular. There are some specific genomic features associated. I have not really presented today the our uh, analysis of the whole genome, uh, but we do find some genomic features and we are still working on this now. And something important is that we have assembled and unprecedented resources. We have a very large biorepository with clinical data, central patch review, and multi-omics data for a large number of patients, including spatial profiling and organoids. We actually do have, uh, Talia mentioned it this morning, a, a supracarcinoid organoid. Uh, and, and we do our best to make this available to the entire community. So if you're interested with this data, most of it is already shared. Here is just a, a small video of what we uh, use. Uh, the UCSC tumor map website is very nice because it allows anyone to 
to explore and interrogate uh, a bit the data. So you can just, just a quick example, you can see you can navigate in the high grade here on the top that is being circled and compare with the low grade and see which gene is more differentially expressed. So you can query that yourself and play with the data and we make it available. And so uh, the, my conclusion is that I think we need now to reconcile a bit the different uh, uh, classification that has been performed either using genomics, the pathology with the immunohistochemistry marker or even the radiologist. And I think we need to work, the three communities need to work together to make a, a, a really clinically, biologically meaningful uh, classification of these tumors. So with this, I would like to acknowledge uh, our entire team, the pathologist, uh, the omics data uh, generation and all the, the, the participants that share the, the, their tumors, of course, and all the hospitals that provide us some tumors and share and also thank you all for your attention and again the NET Research Foundation. Uh, Chrissy? Oh, thanks, Chrissy Thurwell, University of Exeter. It's fascinating work. I know we've already started some conversations around sort of sharing cohorts and things. I, I'm interested in the immune <coughs> microenvironment and also thinking about you know, has this work led to identifying any novel therapeutic targets for us? Because when I think back to the PDR001 study, it was the atypical lung nets, which were the only ones that had any kind of measurable response in the use of mono immunotherapy. So it's actually nice to have seen that. And I wonder, maybe they were the super carcinoids <coughs> looking back. So it's really nice to see that that's actually come out in the molecular biology. But has, has this sort of lit up any ideas for where we might think for novel therapeutic approaches? Yeah, thank you. So, so Indeed, I, I totally agree, and, and very more generally speaking, I, I think when there are clinical trials with immunotherapy, we should try to generate transcriptomic data, because then we could try to understand why they fail in some patient, and this is far from being routinely done. And I think here, you, we can clearly see some big differences in, in gene expression uh, on some immune uh, genes. Uh, typically, yes, the supracarcinoid could be more the uh, can good candidate for immunotherapy. I think we have DLS3 here, which is also expressed very specifically in carcinoid A1 group. So I, I think, again, here is a very good illustration. If you just blindly uh, try a treatments in some patients uh, like this, it will likely fail in a good proportion of patients. So, so yeah, I think supracarcinoids are good candidates for, for this uh, immunotherapy. Yeah, that's right. As a, as a general note of caution, I think we should be a little careful about uh, regarding differential gene expression as a launching pad for therapeutic targets. Uh, Netta just told us about thousands of genes that are differentially expressed. So I, I think we should be circumspect about, about going from expression data to uh, therapeutic targets. But Don? In that regard, I was interested in your immune profiling as well and wondered two questions. Have you validated that by looking at the immune cells by IHC to see what actually is present? And then uh, do you see an M1 versus M2 switch? And do you have more of, an, of a suppressive phenotype in the worst tumors compared to a permissive phenotype? Yeah, thank you. So there are two questions here. One is about the validation of the immune checkpoint genes expression in immunohistochemistry, and the other is about the macrophages if we see both N1 and M2. So, so, so for the first question, not yet. We, we, are, we are in the process of doing that also with a, with a spatial uh, proteomics. Uh, we, we are uh, starting to do that. And for the macrophages, actually, we do both M1 and M2 in the supracarcinoids. So you see both. Do you see a different ratio in the worse, more aggressive tumors with more of an M2 phenotype? No. We see, we see both of them in the supracarcinoid, and they are in very lower proportion in the, in the other carcinoids, but we don't see something specific in the ratio. Also, with the limitation of the sample sizes, we don't have a very big sample size here of supracarcinoids, so yeah. Go ahead. Martin Kaplan, London. Yeah, great talk, Matt. And I think it highlights the important that historically atypical and typical carcinoid has been useful for classification, but we're actually we've got to be moving much more into a, a, a biological neuroendocrine classification for these uh, tumours, and this work is so important for that. And uh, you didn't mention um, Zest Homolog 2, which is often overexpressed, which is a drug of all target um, as well. And how do you put it all together? Because CD44 cancer, cancer stem cell marker, but seen differentially expressed in low grade versus the high grade neuroendocrine, uh, pulmonary neuroendocrine tumors. How are you putting 
all of that t um, together. Initially, honestly, I was thinking when, when we first saw that four, four or five years ago, thinking, yeah, typical atypical doesn't make sense. We should move to the, to the molecular classification we have produced. Actually, I start to think that it's not exactly the case because if you, if you look at this here, the, the, the K67 that we see is, is actually not making a big difference in all our three groups, okay, without considering supracarcinoid. So I do think that there are actually pointing to different things. I think the classification, typical atypical, is actually relatively good at showing a proliferation, just here illustrated with K67, even though it's not part of the classification. But, uh, but we do see something a bit orthogonal. So I think if we try to make a prognosis prediction tool, actually, uh, we would have our three groups being quite effective to, to, to predict prognosis, but also K67 K67 or as a proxy typical atypical is, is also part of, the, of, of this. Then for your, for your other question, I think this is still something that I cannot answer today. Uh, I don't know exactly how these specific targets are expressed. We are still exploring a bit this. Uh, but yeah, as someone mentioned for, for previously, this large omics data, they contain so much that we need a lot of time to, to process everything. And that's also why we need to share them and make them available to others. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we'll welcome uh, Yotam Dreer from Hebrew University of Jerusalem. I want to talk to you today about uh, enhancers. Uh, these are, just so we're on the same page, uh, DNA regulatory elements that can regulate the transcription of genes that may be found farther away along the chromosome. And they do that by recruiting uh, the transcriptional factor machinery and looping onto the gene that they regulate. And an interesting point on that is that in different cell types, different epigenetic contexts, you could have different uh, enhancers that are active and that are looping and regulating the gene, thus allowing the cell to rewire the regulatory circuit of a given gene uh, depending on the epigenetic context. And in each site uh, epigenetic state, the active enhancers are marked by various uh, epigenetic marks, including this uh, histone modification known as H3K27 acetyl, acetylation of lysine 27. And specifically, I want to focus on super enhancers, which are basically just the clustered enhancers, or a few enhancers in the same loci, but the sum is greater than its part, and they are able to efficiently support transcription of key targets. And from the tumor biology perspective, it's interesting because it allows us to uh, understand what are the genes that are important for the tumor, uh, oncogenes, uh, potential susceptibilities and sensitivities this tumor may have. And they can also be targeted, as we'll see in the end. So we started this journey of mapping enhancers genome-wide several years ago, uh, starting with ileal nets and pancreatic nets. And as you uh, may see here, looking at ileal nets, if you look, this is, this is just showing the overall correlation of genome-wide you know, genome of the enhancers. So if you take any two ileal carcinoids, they will have very similar enhancer landscape. Uh, genome-wide, this is like the high correlation in yellow. But if you look on pancreatic NAT, it's much more variable. So we focused on these and tried to separate them to separate groups or subtypes according to the enhancer landscape, and then compare them. And uh, when we started comparing them, we noticed super enhancers near ARX and IRX2 in one subtype and PDX1 in the other subtype. And as you may know, these are master regulators of ARX and IRX2, master regulator of alpha cells, PDX1 of beta cells. So that kind of suggested that this is showing us uh, that they are already started differentiating towards alpha cell-like at least, or beta cell-like. And it's important to mention that these are all non-functional. Peanuts, right? So no insulinomas, no gluconomas, but they're already in their enhancer landscape. You can already see differentiating towards this, even though they're not uh, full, fully differentiated. And so we uh, validated that on large, larger cohorts by staining for PDX1 and ARX. And in most cases, as you can see here, we either get very clear uh, staining for ARX, but not for PDX1, or very clear for PDX1, but not for ARX kind of supporting this. And then we expanded uh, our cohort to 21 peanuts where we profiled again genome-wide enhancer maps using K27-acetyl chip seq. And now looking on known alpha cell enhancers here in blue, 
uh, you see that the Rx positive tumors uh, have high acetylation of the, specifically of the alpha cell enhancers, and the PDX positive tumors have acetylation of the beta cell enhancers supporting our hypothesis. And so lastly, we wanted to see if that has some clinical relevance, and indeed it does. Uh, so the PDX1 positive patients do much better than the Rx positive patient. In fact, PDX1 positive almost never have a relapse. And this is not redundant with what's currently used as a bad prognosis marker, so it's completely independent of tumor size. It is somewhat related to alt status, but it's not redundant. So like if you have PDX1, you don't really care about the alt status. They all do relatively well. But with the ARX positive, the ones that are both ARX positive and alt positive do much worse. So encouraged by uh, these results, we wanted to extend that to other neuroendocrine tumors. And here I show you uh, new unpublished data on low-grade lung nets. Uh, so you can see here, again, this correlation heat map. And what you can appreciate is, again, that the uh, lung nets show some heterogeneity, even larger than the, the one we, we see in the pancreatic nets. But still, we see overall shared features across all neuroendocrine tumors. So that's interesting. And also regarding uh, the first session, uh, the very interesting first session, we also tried to profile some of the classic, more classical uh, models, so 2D grown uh, cell lines, and then also uh, mice xenograft grown from, from the cell lines. And they all are pretty different than the primary tumors, or at least and the enhancer landscape, they're not faithful models, kind of stressing the need to come up with uh, new uh, models. And hopefully the, the, the newer models that we heard about will be more faithful in, in that regard. So that would be very interesting to check. But uh, focusing here back on the heterogeneity of uh, lung neuro neuroendocrine tumors, and this is just looking at typical uh, lung uh, nets, you can see two major subtypes. And we, again, compared these subtypes, and uh, we didn't see uh, much of a developmental side like we saw before, but we do see super enhancer near key genes, uh, specifically uh, SOX4 and ASCAL1 on one subtype, and then uh, HNFs and FG FGFRs on the other. And this kind of loop us back to the previous talk, where, as you heard, in uh, 2019, they were coming up with three uh, subtypes. Uh, based on uh, transcription and, and methylome and whole genome sequencing. And so we wanted also to align our uh, data with that. And if you, if you know, if you all, maybe you already noticed that some of these uh, super enhancers are shared with the markers that was discovered. So it does align pretty well with those subtypes. It's not perfect, but it's pretty well. But now that we know the, the super enhancers of each subtype, we can try to look at potential sensitivities of these. As I mentioned before, one of the subtypes has a strong super enhancers near both FGFR3 and FGFR4. So we thought they may be sensitive for FGF inhibition. So tried that currently just in cell lines. We're now running it in mice uh, xenografts. And we see at least initially promising results. So that may be an interesting uh, therapeutic avenue to follow up on. Uh, so at least for these particular subtypes. Uh, another thing we wanted to check is to look at uh, sensitivity for overall CDK7 or 9 inhibition, which is known to uh, specifically target super enhancers. And here we see even a more drastic response in, in all cell lines uh, that we tested, uh, which sort of supposed to represent the different subtypes. And so that's another uh, promising direction. And we profiled their enhancers after inhibition to compare what are the targets that's changing. So we're still kind of in the process. It's all new data, but uh, we have a few can potential candidate hits. The last thing I want to mention is that now that we basically sequence the enhancers of these tumors, we can now look at the uh, genetics of these enhancers, right? The genetic changes in these enhancers. We know a lot about the exome of these uh, tumors, thanks to, you know, all the one before, right? The talks before on the exome sequencing done in all these, uh, but still not enough about changes in enhancers. So here I show you, this is like an example, but 
probably one of the leading examples or in the same enhancer we can detect five different mutations in five different tumors suggesting that these recurrent mutations are selected for because this uh, enhancer is important for the disease so to validate our approach but also to validate the uh, that specific enhancer and indeed uh, these mutation all they are all real uh, so just to sum up I showed you that uh, enhancer profiling of neuroendocrine tumors allow us to detect uh, clinically relevant biomarkers and reveal new potential drug targets on, and drug uh, or therapeutic strategies, uh, as well as pro maybe get some glimpse at the genetics behind this. And uh, with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Brad Bernstein, uh, my postdoc mentor, where this all, all this work started with the ileal and um, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, which was also a joint work with Ramesh uh, and the student Paloma, uh, and all the new lung neuroendocrine data that was generated in my lab. And uh, this work was led by Esti, Mirab, Shahid, and Israel, with close collaboration with the neuroendocrine unit at the Adassa Medical Center with uh, Simona and Shani. So, with that, I'll take any questions you may have. My name is Shen Jinghua. I'm from University of Pennsylvania. <clears throat> so I noticed uh, the interesting uh, observation you have these uh, arcs, uh, okay, and the PDX1 uh, deregulation, deregulation correlated with the, the, the lineage and also aggressiveness of the, the patient. And also, like the arc and, uh, and the ALT, the, that positive even worse, right? right? So my question is, uh, because ARC also is ARC regulated in the alpha cell, so I wonder whether those lineages have some separation with the uh, alpha tumor or beta cell tumor, uh, number one. Number two is uh, because the alteration of, uh, uh, of the telomere is uh, related to the DAX, right? DAX represents whether there's some correlation uh, as well with the aggressive phenotype. Thank you. Yes. Uh, generally, it, these are the same tumors. We don't have necessarily the data for uh, the DAX mutation in our cohort, but we know that, yes, this is basically, uh, these are the same tumors. So you can either check out status or the, the DAX ATRX muta mutations. And for the first part, the ARX positive tumors, those are the ones that have the enhancer landscape that are similar to alpha cells. So, you know, it's not entirely, they're not alpha cells, right? They're still tumors, they're uh, not fully differentiated. Some of the differentiated markers are missing, but they are like towards the, the they look more like alpha cells. Um, I was intrigued by your data on the mutations in the enhancers, mainly because we're interested because we're doing a similar thing or looking in MEM1. <coughs> One of the debates we're having is what level of mutation do you think you need to, to actually affect the function of that enhancer? So are point mutations enough or do you need like a bigger deletion? So I think that depends, right? So what, what we are also doing, I haven't shown the, that, is that we are analyzing how this mutation affects the transcription factor binding sites and then experimentally validating transcription factor binding. So I think you know, if the mutation occurs in a critical point in the transcriptional, and also it depends on the transcription factor, right? But but there are some transcription factors that have that really need you know specific sequence at specific <laughs> spot. If you hit that, then yes, that would make a difference. But then if you just take like random mutation and enhancer, so a single point will not be good enough. So that it depends on the context. But of course, if you delete the enhancer, then that's more powerful. But we think that at least in, in some examples, just point mutation is enough to change uh, transcription factor binding and, and function. Yeah, hi, Eric, Dr. for UCSF. Uh, nice talk. Uh, since Chris Heafy's he, in the room, I want to put him on the spot because he, he published some data in a large co international cohort looking at you know, ARX and uh, PDX1 as far as prognostic factors in peanuts. And, I think we know that having a single lymph node positive tumor is probably the most you know, poor predictor of outcome. 
And I think when he controlled for that, he found that AR, you know, ARX and DAX, or, or PDX1, were not cognostic in non-functioning PNETs, whereas ALT and DAX and ARTX were. I just wondered, I don't know, Chris has a comment on that. Uh, sure. So, I mean, they're, they're different populations, right? So in the paper that we published, it was 560 cases uh, from multiple different cohorts. Um, obviously, we participated in, in this study as well to look it up. Uh, the one, the, the larger set was uh, non-syndromic. Um, and in this particular case, I think it's about 50-50 in terms of inherited syndrome. So different populations. Uh, we found that ALT was the strongest prognostic marker. There's definitely some, there's a lot, still a lot of information with uh, the alpha cell like or beta cell like um, that you're seeing here. Um, I, th I think just in that set, uh, when we c try to control it for a you know a larger population and a very similar population for looking at outcomes, we found that ALT was the strongest prognostic marker, and that was independent of these other ones. Um, but there's it could definitely be playing a role in, in multiple different situations, different populations. Um, but that's that's how we looked at it. If you look at the data here too, ALT was a strong prognostic marker, just as ARX and PDX1 was a strong prognostic marker. Um, right. I, mean, I, I, I definitely agree that that ALT status is, is very important, right? And then I, I do think that there is added value also in, in whether you're alpha-like or beta-like. But uh, but yes, definitely ALT status is very important. I think ALT status goes along pretty well with the alpha like subtype, um, you know, yeah. they track pretty, pretty strongly together as well. Yeah, yeah. definitely. From the audience here. Hi, I actually have the same question, uh, but following up on that, um, I do think there, there's a link between the two, but can you physiologically explain that? So is there a link between ultimate length between of telomeres and alpha or beta cell or escalation of your uh, of your <coughs> Uh, so the, I guess the short answer is that I don't know. Uh, it, it would be interesting to look at whether uh, we can understand how, how, how these alpha-like cells uh, drive the, the alt status. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. We, we are not following up with it currently, but uh, maybe we should. Can you see the signal near the telomere? Is that something you can look at? or? Yeah. So that's hard to look at because these sequences are hard to, to map. So we can't do that with this regular ChIP-seq approach. But we, I mean, we could tr possibly try to look at it, but I, we haven't looked at it. I don't know. Uh, it's a bit hard with the telomeres too because the sequences are repetitive. We have one, uh, one final question from the virtual audience. Uh, it's, uh, reads, thanks a lot for this great overview. How easily are those super enhancers analyzed and tested in a trans translation clinical setting? What material is needed? Uh, fresh frozen, FFPE, or similar? In other words, how easily is the subtractification applied in clinics? So, uh, right, so mapping enhancers is not trivial. Uh, we usually prefer to do that from uh, fresh or fresh frozen tissue. And I'm not sure that would translate directly to the clinics, but from the research perspective, I think that's very useful, help us to focus on uh, the, the genes and, and pathways that are important. And then as we can, so we, we sh as we can see, or as, at least in this case, we can find biomarkers that can then be readily tested in the clinics, right? Like PDX1 and ARX. Uh, so we, the discovery is led by the enhancer mapping, but then to translate it to the clinics, we probably need to, to focus on, on several biomarkers that are more robust and easier to test in the clinics. Thank you. Final speaker in this session will be joining us virtually, William Huang from Mass General Hospital about developmental lineages and mediators of metastasis at single cell resolution of PNETs. Good morning. Thank you, Ramesh and Carl, for that kind introduction. And thank you to the organizers of the NETRF Symposium for inviting us to speak about our work on pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. My name is William Huang, and I'm from Massachusetts General Hospital. And my name is Karina Xiao, and I'm also from the Massachusetts General Hospital. 
So pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are one of two major types of malignancies that develop in the human pancreas, the other being pancreatic ductal adenocarcinomas. And pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, or peanuts, they account for about 7% of all pancreatic cancers based on this year's cancer statistics. Over 4,000 patients are diagnosed in the United States each year, and about half to a little over half are metastatic at the time of diagnosis with pretty dramatic differences in five-year survival rate, as you can see here in this inset. So within PNETs, there's a lot of interest in understanding how we can bring precision oncology into the management of patients with this tumor type. And the most common, the initial branch point for these tumors is between functional tumors and non-functional tumors based on whether they secrete excess hormone or not. Within the functional, they're further subdivided based on the cell type that they derive from, uh, with insulinomas from beta cells being the most common. And non-functional, while they don't secrete excess hormones, various studies, including one by my colleagues uh, at Mass General a few years ago in Nature Medicine, have looked at these non-functional peanuts from a bulk transcriptomic and epigenetic standpoint. And right now, there are four broad categories that we can divide these tumors in based on their transcriptional and epigenetic states. The alpha cell-like subtype, which is defined by the ARX transcription factor, the beta cell-like or PDX1 high subtype, proliferative, and then the stromal mesenchymal. And the major goal of our pilot project was to develop and optimize a single nucleus RNA sequencing approach where we could get the single cell resolution, transcriptomic information, to see if we could refine this molecular taxonomy of peanuts and further improve our ability to determine how to best treat patients with different subtypes of pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasms. So along with our colleagues at Mass General and the pathology and surgery departments, we've been able to amass a pretty large cohort of primary resected peanut specimens. So far, we've processed 20 using a refined uh, single nucleus RNA sequencing approach. And we have another five or six that we've collected since uh, this data was collected. So just to give you a sense, the vast majority of these patients are untreated at the time of surgical resection. And most of these are non-functional, although we have one glucagonoma, patient four, uh, that we successfully processed. We also tried two insulinomas, samples 21 and 22, but these failed during experimental processing, and we're currently looking into the buffer conditions and further optimization that seems to be necessary for insulinomas. The grades vary from grade one to grade three, various size tumors. Most of these are node negative, although we had two patients that had node involvement. And we had a very interesting patient, patient number 20, actually had their primary tumor resected in 2015. We also have some adjacent normal tissue from that resection. And then three years later, they developed a solitary metastasis to the liver that was also resected and collected. And then three years after that, a second solitary lesion to the liver was also resected. And that time, we also got some adjacent normal tissue. And we'll spend some time talking about this unique patient. This is a summary a schematic of the 24 study specimens that we had that I just described. And for all of these samples, we did single nucleus RNA sequencing. And then for patient 20, we did whole exome sequencing, all, all five of that patient's specimens. And right now, I'll turn it over to Karina, who's going to describe our single nucleus RNA sequencing data. Yeah, thank you so much, Will. So using single nucleus RNA-seq, we recovered over 187,000 high-quality profiles from 24 specimens. Here in this, each individual dot is a cell, and we pseudocolored the cells by sample number. We annotated the cells using unsupervised clustering and canonical gene markers, and we identified a diverse population of cell types, including neuroendocrine cells, endothelial cells, and various immune subsets. We explored the copy number variations in the annotated neuroendocrine population. So we first looked at the non-neuroendocrine cells, which are on the right of the UMAP, and using infer CMV, we identified copy number variations for these cells. As expected, there isn't an obvious pattern in CNVs for the non neuro cells. We then looked at the CNVs in the neuroendocrine cells, which are on the left of the UMAP, and we can see that there's massive regions of copy number loss and gain, suggesting that the annotated neuroendocrine population is predominantly malignant. 
In this particular example, we observe that there is an amplification of chromosome 4 and deletion of chromosomes 6, 8, and 11. After subsetting to only the malignant neuroendocrine cells, we want to learn de novo gene expression programs. We will use an unsupervised clustering approach called non-trix factorization to cluster the malignant neuroendocrine cells into subgroups. We're still in the process of working on this, so I don't have real data to show, but I'll walk us through a high-level overview of the clustering procedure and what we want to achieve from it. So let's say that we start with 600 malignant cells here, shown as individual dots. And in this mock example, the 600 cells cluster into approximately six subgroups. So through machine learning, we can identify the centroids for these subgroups. And while cells can be easily clustered into a subgroup, there are others that may be more difficult to differentiate. For example, this cell here is halfway between centroids two and three, suggesting that it lies in an intermediate state. After acquiring the profiles for each of these centroids, we hope to compare them to subtypes that have been previously described in the literature um, that Will previously talked about. And it would be interesting to explore whether or not we can capture similar subtypes at single cell resolution and whether we can identify new subtypes too. To reiterate, this is a mock example as we're in the process of refining our true results. So now I'll turn it back to you, Will, to talk about the whole exome sequencing on the unique patient. Great, thank you, Karina. So we identified over 13,000 germline indels and over 20,000 germline SNVs in this patient. Uh, as you can see, there is an enrichment in C to T and, and T to C uh, mutations. And when we looked at the cosmic database, SBS6 and SBS26 were the most enriched from in our data set. And these have been associated with defective DNA mismatch repair previously. And this also lined up with when we looked at individual genes that were mutated in the germline. Some of them are listed here and some of the top ones are in this table as well. Uh, you can see that some of these are ve very common in peanuts based on a whole genome analysis of 98 resected peanuts in Scarpa et al. As you can see in the reference here. And others like ATRX were not seen in that data set at all. One caveat is that this data was analyzed using a germline reference derived from the matched adjacent normal pancreas or non-malignant pancreas. When we looked at that sample, 4.4% of those non-malignant cells were deemed neuroendocrine. And when we performed in first CNV, we did see that there appears to be some malignant cells that were in that uh, normal reference. So this is something that we're adjusting for at this time, uh, in part by actually taking matched blood from the same patient as the germline reference. Another thing we wanted to look at was to see if we could better understand the drivers of metastasis in this patient and peanuts in general. So we identified 920 somatic indels and just under 2,000 somatic SNVs. And if you look at this table, again, this is just some select genes. The vast majority of uh, somatic missense mutations were seen in the primary and metastatic specimens. But one of the ones that jumped out to us was MUC5B which was only seen in the two metastases, not in the primary tumor. And this has been associated previously uh, with metastatic, more aggressive tumor behavior in other malignancies such as breast cancer. So this is something that we're further exploring at this time. So in summary, to the best of our knowledge, this is the largest single cell transcriptomic data set uh, for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and it's continuing to grow. And we have this very interesting case study of a primary peanut that had two solitary metastases that were both resected. And using this as an exemplar, uh, we really want to integrate transcriptomic and genomic data and uh, potentially develop new computational methods to do a better job of inferring mutational status from transcriptomic signatures. And with that, I'd like to thank all the members of our team pictured here on the left and from our lab retreat on the top right our many collaborators uh, shown on the bottom, both at Mass General and at Dana-Farber, all of our funding agencies pictured on the bottom, and in particular, the Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation for giving us a chance to do this project, uh, which has been really fruitful so far, and we're excited to see what we'll learn uh, with this collaboration moving forward. And last but not least, all of our patients and their families for donating their time and their tumor specimens uh, for, for, to enable this research. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Chang Chang from uh, Rutgers. Um, have you validated the uh, CMVs that you detect from the infer CMV algorithm? Because um, finding such recurrent you know, chromosome changes, it's not something that's been reported before in, in, in PNAS. Um, no, so we haven't done that yet, and we're in the process of um, investigating those infer CMV results more carefully. Um, and so that's why we also are not too sure um, whether or not we're using the appropriate samples to do the comparisons. And so um, we are going to be looking into the, the blood samples that we had collected at the same time of resection to, to see if um, they'll shed some light on that. Do you think instead of uh, adjacent normal tissue, um, really high quality purified islets might be a better control? So that that's a, um, a good suggestion. I don't believe we, we have those. And so we, so we collected the adjacent normal. And so that's, it's contaminated. So I don't really trust um, that we'll be able to find like really purified islets as you suggested. Um, but hopefully like the, the blood will, the leukocytes from the blood will be um, more informative. Is there any specific reason that you guys take the single nuclear RNA seq rather than single cell? Yeah, so we're working with a uh, pancreas, and so in the pancreas they secrete a lot of enzymes, and so if we use single cell, um, it, it kind of like degrades the sample very quickly, and so we found that using single nucleus RNA seq, we can preserve um, the sample like frozen for longer periods of time before having to process it. Can you tell it all from the U maps or whatever? Maybe even if you've done some of the uh, the uh, NNF, whether among the malignant cells do they segregate into two populations or they really look more monotonous as a single state? Uh, so from the U map we showed, it seems like they are kind of monotonous, um, but we're doing the NMF right now to see if we can learn a more distinctive programs. So I'll have to get back to you on that once we finish um, that analysis. There's uh, one question from the, from the virtual audience. Uh, it says regarding missense variants, how will you attempt to figure out whether they are disease associated or benign? Yeah, so um, right now, like all the, the mutations that we showed during the presentation, we're not sure whether they're functional or not. So um, we'll definitely have to dive into the literature to see um, if they're, it's, they've been reported and whether they're um, functional. Um, another thing is we could follow up with some functional validation, but we haven't um, made any like solid plans for, for that approach yet. I can ask my lingering question because I want to ask it of you, you. You made a comment, it's really about everything, but you made a comment where you said, would I be really careful about thinking about these, these databases and how we're going to be able to get to drug treatment? And I agree with uh, one side of that. On the other side, that's the goal of this work, is to get us to a point where we can use this information to get to drug treatment. What if, for example, we query these databases for G protein coupled receptors that are orphan receptors, looked through drug screens to see if, uh, and, and peptide binding screens, maybe we could get a new theragnostic, maybe we could get a, a, a new drug that would get to them. I, I think those kind of ways of looking at these databases, they really do offer the chance. It'll be work, but that effort, we're just missing it, and, 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 that, and yet you guys have this data coming. And so, the idea that we can get to drugs with this, that's been done now already, in, 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 it's in the brain, but uh, with new Parkinson's treatments, for example. But I see this as holding great promise, and I wonder to what makes you temperate, or were you just trying to speak generally, or, or is that hidden inside this, is, is that next step? Yeah, I, 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 you know, I think people have been sequencing transcripts or, or assessing transcripts initially by microarrays and more recently by, by more uh, sort of uh, sequencing-based methods. Uh, I, I'm hard-pressed to find any significant example of a drug target that was discovered 
uh, by that method. Uh, there are probably literally thousands of papers published on, with that methodology. But I, I, I mean, may, maybe I'm missing something. Uh, but I think there are, there's a lot of value in a multi-pronged approach where you start with the RNA and then build on that with the genetics or with you know, very careful validation. But for all of the effort that's been invested over the last couple of decades now, I don't know if a single drug that has come out of, from that approach alone. I, I submit it can be done. It is being done. I think Ned is looking at these receptors, just tells us that she's looking at a group of targets that could lead us to better theragnostics, that could lead us uh, to better drug treatments, but I, I, my point is not to be so argumentative as much as to say it will take effort because it's got to go through the process of you know validating if they're actually expressed at the at the cell surface, and then uh, are they going to uh, be the kind of things that we can drug, and will they have an outcome? But I'm very excited. I think it's a new world, and I think the the uh, the specific cell types, the most malignant cell types, opens up a whole new opportunity to try to see if we can get to drugs that will be more effective. Chrissy. Uh, yeah, I don't have a whole list of examples, Ramesh, at all. It's that the point I was trying to make earlier was we'd actually seen a clinical signal in a clinical trial, then actually it's kind of nice to see that replicated in some of the molecular biology work that we're doing. And we were giving sinitinib as another example before we really knew much more about VEGF expression and other things in, in pancreatic nets. And, and I think it partly reflects the real challenges we have when we're studying uh, you know, any rare disease but a rare cancer. But it was more the point that we'd seen a response in the atypical nets and immunotherapy. And now, you know, five, six years later, we are seeing some molecular biology to support that, perhaps, perhaps. I would just comment, so Don Quell, I, I would just comment that these are great discussion points and I think the, the multi-pronged, multi-omic approach really will get you, I hope, at a point where everything will uh, converge and give you better guidance on which targets to focus on because that is the key question. You've got great data and probably you have little golden nuggets all throughout there and it's just which do you land on to begin studying? And, and hopefully with more omics approaches used together and integrated, then it will guide you. I was just sort of distinguishing a little bit between, you know, when you think about drivers versus, James, you're talking a little more about, about targets for a CAR-T or a bispecific or a radiotherapy, right? I mean, if you have very high expression and it's selective, I do think that's a pretty good argument there. I think, I think Ramesh, you were referring to sort of a number of failures along the way. Assuming that a highly expressed gene, if you could target it with an inhibitor, uh, was a vulnerability. And I guess I would just sort of separate those two. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I just like someone tell me one example where you know, two decades worth of RNA analysis of tumors uh, has led to a has led cogently and and, and tangibly to a drug. I, I, I don't think there is such an example. All the breast cancer uh, drugs that are effective, targeting uh, mutations that were identified? No, mutations, yes. yes. Mutations because of their drivers. RNA, I'm talking sorry. about RNA. That's right. I'm, just transcriptomics. I'm not saying that I mean, there's, there's plenty of examples of drugs coming out of genetic uh, analysis. There's, just, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. So, I, I think it's a bit oversimplifying to say that with RNA, you don't discover anything, so you need genetics. I think we are in a kind of triangulation process where you actually start to have a hint that maybe a group of patients, a subset of patients might benefit from a drug. Maybe it has not been identified or maybe it's not targeting the, directly the RNA. But I think here when you start, I didn't show it in my presentation, but I think the, the RNA sequencing and methylation are very good at phenotyping the tumor. So really understanding at the global level how the tumor looks like molecularly. Then within a group, a molecular group, if you find a target, I would be much more confident targeting this particular mutation if it's happening in an homogeneous, molecularly homogeneous group of patients. So I think we need to approach this to, to, to point toward the same direction. Uh, and this is certainly an effective way to, 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 to effectively identify a group of patients that is, is likely to respond to a drug treatment. I, 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 I don't think the feel. I don't think the that 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 RNA that just looking at RNA seq is not enough, and you know, we should both use like milton as, as suggested, 
that's much more helpful. And these are also just, you know, basis to raise hypotheses that should then be validated and tested. So definitely RNA is not enough, but it is, I think, part of the picture and help us understand uh, some of the, the biology behind that, so, which is helpful. So. Yeah, I, I don't want to be mistaken for a Luddite. I, I, I t <laughs> no, no, and, and I'm not disputing the, the phenotypic value of RNA sequencing. All I'm saying is we should be circumspect about saying, here's a list of genes, there are my 10 uh, targets, and I'm going to cure this cancer uh, in my lifetime by just having that RNA information. I, I, I'm just saying we should be cautious about, about the, the, the promise we are offering uh, our patients and, uh, and the NIH using that, that logic. Do you, do you consider it a valid distinction, though, the, the comment about, say, targets for cell-based therapies or bites, where overexpression, just the presence of something might be enough rather than a dependency? Or do you apply the same skepticism to that? I'm, I'm not sure why I'm on the spot here. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, no, I think yeah. Exactly. but yeah, but, but let's take that, right? So I, I'd like someone to point out to me one good example. I think Xian Shin's work with the CDH17, which is now in clinical trials, uh, is an example of potentially identifying a target for a CAR T-cell-like approach. Uh, and, and for that, I think the data is, is definitely out there for genes that are expressed very selectively in a single cell type. Uh, but, you know, let's be honest. For all, you know, there are, I think, more than 100 CAR T cell companies out there. I'm not talking about projects. These are companies that are d dedicated to the CAR T cell. And, and to this day, we still, you know, can only really... Uh, put into remission a, a handful of B-cell neoplasms. Uh, I, I'm just saying we should, be, we should understand that the, that the problems we face are, are not likely to be solved by just staring at lists of genes. That, that's, that's my only point. <laughs> yeah, something here as well. Um, I definitely agree the multi-omics approach is the way to go and integrate different types of data. But I want to add also like, I feel that from the transcriptome sequencing data, we have also learned a lot um, and it kind of nicely supports the genomic data we have created of the multifocal lesions because we actually see, I've been looking at these recept receptors and some of them are nicely consistently overexpressed in all the multifocal tumors within a patient. However, there are a lot of cases that you can see differences in the expression levels of that single uh, receptor between these tumors from the same patient. So, so it might be also sometimes um, interesting to think about like with these multifocal cases that, okay, if you treat these patients, what if some of these tumors only react to the therapy and not the other ones? And, and these are kind of building up another layer to, to, to these data sets that it's good to keep in mind. It's, it's the gap between the, the genetics, the gene expression, and setting up the right assays for the drug screen that makes it so hard, that, that's what I submit. That, that it's, it, that's not very often done, and especially not in neuroendocrine cancers. I kind of, I was thinking about the, the enhancer differences that you're seeing, and I was just wondering how you thought about distinguishing between cell type of origin. So are you, are you really discovering who gave rise to this versus the, the tumorigenic contributors? And, and just sort of, I know it's a broad question, but how do you think about that? Yeah, so definitely what we see is uh, some superposition of both. Um, so it is quite reflective of the cell of origin. So definitely some of the enhancers we see reflect the cell of origin, but then we know there are changes uh, in the tumor. Um, and it's not trivial to tell apart which is which. Uh, we, we can sometimes get uh, some, I guess, suggestive evidence of, of what is what, because we know we can analyze and, and predict which enhancers are driven by which transcription factors, and we can see, for example, transcription factors that were not expressed or not thought to be expressed in the cell of origin. Um, but, but yes, I mean, these are open questions. It's hard because we also don't know enough about the cell of origin, right? Uh, so we, we can have some guesses, but um, but we definitely see superposition of both, and we can probably use that uh, if we're talking about uh, you know how to use that to classify patients or 
see the clinical, so we, it's, it's, sort, it's a plus and a minus, right? It's also a, a feature uh, that we, we actually integrate both things into predict how the patient will respond. Yeah, I, I think it kind of actually important to regress back to, this, to the same conversation, but this, how do you know you're, you're just not studying epiphenomenon versus tumorigenic drivers? And because that, that's what we kind of care about. Right, so it's a valid point. We, we don't know that all the changes we see are indeed tumorigenic. We don't claim that they are, right? It, it, it depends what conclusion you try to uh, drive from it. So for patient classification, you don't necessarily need to know that this is tumorigenic or not, right? So that's one aspect that we can, we can use that. I mean, I think it does suggest a few, especially if we see the super enhancers that we know are uh, very strong in the tumor and are not, probably not in the cell of origin as much as we can identify and profile the cell of origin. I think it is suggests that these are tumorigenic and then you need to test that, right? So just way to raise hypothesis, you need to test that. And in some cases there will be, in some cases there won't, but you, it gives you like a relatively narrow list to, to validate. So it's a great hypothesis generator. No, I think that testing that, that hypothesis is, is extremely hard, right? I mean, Especially in neuroendocrine, where we don't have good models to test, yes. Um, at least not yet, maybe we will have soon, but um, yes, but I, I agree that, that, that this is a necessary step. Does it worry you that by studying the tumor DNA, RNA, or multiomics, uh, that you could be missing a niche factor, an immune response factor, something that is not generated from the DNA of the tumor itself, but perhaps from the environment. And how are you considering other effects uh, that might be uh, really responsible for the promotion of the tumor? That is exactly what we are discussing uh, all the time, so that, okay, we don't see anything um, really recurrent on genome level transcriptome data. I think we have still hypotheses we can look from that data. Uh, DNA methylation data as well, it's still ongoing process. But uh, having multiple collisions in really um, specific area of the small bowel, um, you would think that there would be some common factor underlying this whole thing. Field cancerization hasn't produced that either, what we are, have been looking at. And, and of course, we are trying to do whatever we can with the data we currently have. Of course, we can still generate some other types of data from this. We haven't looked into, but that is definitely the thing that if anybody has any ideas outside the box, we are really happy to discuss those because we are sometimes feeling that we are kind of like hitting the wall, uh, that what else can there be? And, and the tumor microenvironment, currently, personally, I'm really intrigued by this question. And uh, we can use the RNA sequencing data kind of through receptors, trying to understand if something is overexpressed or something is secreted to the, to the tumor microenvironment and if it's somehow apparent uh, compared to the normal situation in a patient, but still, um, I'm sure there could be other methods also we could still use, but of course having those models would also help in this type of work. But it is like a mystery, so, so we need more uh, questions. Just one, one quick comment related to that, because I'm obviously involved in that work. With the discussions that we have, clearly Eric has some really neat ideas about whether there's something that's secreted and then causes that effect, but something that none of us has really been doing across the whole of NetOF is looking at the microbiome. But again, thinking about it, why would it then affect that small bit of the small intestine? But you know, that's an area that I don't think has really been explored. But it's you know, when I talk about this, oh, they're really, you know, they're really intriguing tumors, meaning we've done absolutely everything, and we still don't really know what's going on. And this is after 15 years of working in the field, and you, you, you longer, Steve, you know, yeah, well, <laughs> your sure. life's work. Uh, but if you look at Dr. Annis' field of work in terms of paraganglioma, the of chromosomatoma, where you have this substrate production leading to the development of the tumor, where the gene is mutated, well, in your case, it's mutated, but it leads to over-secretion of a substrate that's present in all cells, that then leads to the development of tumor. Uh, okay, you would pick up the mutation in one of the subunits uh, of succinate, so the androgenase, but the, there could be serotonin normally produced at a higher level that could be then doing something else and you may not pick it up because it's not mutated.
Hi, Jerome. Uh, thank Hi. you. Thank yeah. you for sharing your so, work. I I was um, I was wondering. We we all work on on primary untreated net, and uh, I don't know if you guys have uh, the uh, use to rebiopsy your patients, but uh, if you do, after two or three lines, sometimes I have a hard time knowing what I'm looking at. And that's actually what we are treating when we use all these uh, targeted therapies is after, you know, often one or two lines of chemo or PRT. And I was wondering what, what, what's your stake on, on those subtypes and what they will become after, uh, you know, two or three lines and uh, whether we should start looking at those and make models out of those because those are, the, those are the tumor cells we are treating. We are not treating primary untreated uh, PNET because or, or whatever net because those are usually being resected by, by surgery when possible. So we've touched upon serotonin um, being um, ex like expressed and captured in small bone neuroendocrine tumor and in some PNETs. But I think and when we cross reference, actually, if we look at gene expression or actually even protein expression of the enzyme that actually uh, is the making serotonin, we actually see a lot of those in other neuroendocrine tumor cells as well. So I'm wondering uh, what is Jerome's take at maybe we should look at the enzyme in the uh, histology and, and not just serotonin because right serotonin can be secreted but uh, if it goes out of the cells then if you just look at the tumors then you might not capture it anymore the, the enzymes are not easy because for the, the tph and the and the ddc the, there's not very very good antibodies and i think that it's it's a, a kind of a, of a level issue because you also have serotonin secreting uh, net in the lung and they do have the same fibrotic uh, patterns and, and when you look at serotonin in, in normal islets, you don't see them unless you, you do really immunofluorescence. The levels are very, very low compared to what you see in a small bowel net or serotonin secreting um, pancreatic net. And so I think it's very hard to, to really assess what's the role of serotonin in normal uh, net cells and in, uh, and in non-serotonin secreting detected by uh, immunohistochemistry in, uh, in you know, regular net. The, the, the level is so different, it's so high in, uh, in small bowel or in serotonin pancreatic lung and, uh, and uh, pancreatic net uh, compared to what you see in normal islet. Peanuts and some peanuts and a lot of and several peanuts that we've tested. There's actually a lot of the enzyme, but we still don't see the serotonin um, like in the cells and I think that's probably because they get uh, made and then they just they fuse out and they act on the tumor microenvironment for example but they're not captured so I'm wondering if you share uh, this this hypothesis it, it's it's possible. One thing that's very uh, unstudied is the, uh, the stroma. When, when you look at the, the stroma in, pan, in PANET, the, the more aggressive they are, the more the stroma looks like the PDAC stroma. Uh, and we actually don't, nobody has, has looked at it uh, yet very, very carefully. Um, the, the, more, the, the more aggressive they are, the more stroma you have, you have more calf. And whether, my, my guess was that it was not serotonin related, that it was more a, a you know, PDAC-like mechanisms, but maybe I'm wrong, and maybe it's because of the, the nets, when they get more aggressive, they, they start to make something that makes the, the, the calf uh, proliferate, and maybe it's serotonin, you're right. I, I've never looked at it, actually, uh, but it's true that once the PNET gets more and more aggressive, you get more and more stroma, and the stroma looks like, uh, it's not a PDAC-like stroma, uh, full-blown, but it does resemble what you see in PDAC. Thank you.